Hi everyone, this is James from Wanderlust FP and today I'm going to talk to you about preparing and encoding your footage for editing. The information I'm going to give you in this tutorial should hopefully help you have a much smoother post-production process and it should work with any software and any camera. So whether you're using a DSLR, a RED camera, you're working on Final Cut Pro or Adobe Premiere, Sony Vegas, any software, it should all work all the same, it's just the general workflow. A lot of the information in this tutorial is the theory behind the practice. So you'll understand how to create the whole process, but you'll also understand all of the theory behind it and why we're doing the things that we're doing. If you want just a quick step-by-step -step guide on how to prepare your footage for editing, check out my other tutorial and you'll just get the raw information that you need and the steps to do it. If you want to understand why we're doing the things that we're doing and how maybe you could change the process or adapt it to a different system that suits you, stick with this tutorial and you'll get a full detailed instructions on what happens and why it happens and how you can then change it in different ways to suit your needs. So before you do any encoding or editing, the first thing you want to do is organize your footage. Now luckily for me, I only have one clip, but in general, it's a good code of conduct just to put things in a system that works well for you. I can't tell you the best way to do it. The best advice I can give is just find a system that works well for you and stick with it. You'll be kicking yourself at the end of the day when you realize you can't find a clip or it's taking you forever to do something just purely because you didn't organize yourself at the beginning. So get everything organized in a way that works well for you and then continue on with it and hopefully you'll have a really nice smooth process. So once I've got all my footage organized, I then start to encode it all. Now I encode all of my footage into a different format than what comes out of my camera. And I use a program called Compressor that comes with the Final Cut Pro Suite. Now you might not have Compressor, you might have um, Adobe Premiere, in which case you can use Adobe Media Encoder. You could do it through MPEG Stream Clip or even if you're just exporting something from After Effects, um, the information will still pretty much be the same. So I'm going to go into Compressor and I'm going to grab my file and I'm just going to drop it in. So I've got my file in Compressor and I'm just going to run through some of the settings that come with it. Now my DSLR camera kicks out footage in a quick time file type. So you might be filming at something that does MPEG instead, but most modern cameras are filming in a QuickTime file format. Some people call it the container, so that's just the extension that comes at the end of your file, so it'll say .mov at the end of it, or .mpeg, or .jpeg. Uh, these are all different file types and containers. So now that you've got your file type, within that you have a codec. And that's what's used to encode your footage into the for into a specific format. So my codec that comes out of my camera is H.264. So I have a H.264 codec being used in a QuickTime container. The codecs that I normally work with, because I use Final Cut Pro 7 and I'm working on a Mac, is the ProRes codecs. Now. If you don't have these, you can just use H.264 instead. Um, there are also other examples like animation or PNG. These are all codecs that you can apply within a container of QuickTime or MPEG or anything like that. So any extension you can apply a codec to. So I could have a PNG, which is the image type, that type of codec being used within a QuickTime container. So for example, if I'm exporting something from After Effects and I want to keep it as a high as resolution as possible with an alpha channel, I could use uh, the animation codec in a QuickTime container or I could use the PNG codec in a QuickTime container, get my footage exported out in a really, really high fo resolution format. And then when I have to re-export it again from my editing software, once it's been dropped into the right place, and it's within my final piece, I'm then exporting it out again. I'm still compressing it, but I'm bringing it down to a level that you're not gonna see um, a lot of distortion on it because it's such high quality to begin with. So those are the codecs. As I said before, I use the ProRes codecs. 
So I'm just going to duplicate one to show you and run through some of the settings that come with it. All of them will have a bitrate applied to them. Now the ProRes ones come with their own independent bitrate. You can select one later, but they all run at different bitrate settings. And I have an image just to show you. So these are all the different bit rates that the ProRes codex will use when encoding your footage. H.264 will have automatic ones as well that you can set on it. But in general, you probably want to follow these guidelines when encoding footage. So when I'm working on my footage in my editing software, I tend to use a proxy codec. And you can see here that this is the lowest bit rate that you can get on a 1080 clip. So it's at 45 megabits a second. That's really, really low, which will mean that it's going to be a really poor quality image if I were to export it and try and display it at 1080. But because the windows in Final Cut Pro are so small, it's okay to work with at that, and it's not demanding on my machine. I still get to see the, the image and how nice it looks. I don't lose loads of quality because I'm not scaling it up. I'm looking at a really, really small resolution through those tiny little windows in Final Cut. So it's a good codec for me to work with whilst editing. When I've finished editing and I want to do my color grading and add my graphics and stuff, I tend to use the Apple ProRes 444. Now there is the 444 XQ, which is new, um, but because I'm using Final Cut Pro 7, I can't use that codec, unfortunately. So I have to stick with this one. But a good general practice for you guys to kind of remember is when you're finished doing your editing and you've got all the clips that you want to use, I would then convert them into something that's higher, a higher bitrate than what your camera kicks out. So even if you want to stick with the H.264 codec, when you're using the bitrate settings, make sure that you set it at something that's really, really high so that when you're doing your color grading, you have more data to work with. There'll come a point where you're just wasting space and it's too demanding for your machine, but that's why I tend to stick with the 444 stuff because it works well for me. Also, uh, the color grading software that I use will also export it out in that format for me so I don't have to then re-encode my footage again later. So that's something to remember as well whilst you're working on it. Different bit rates have their place in different parts of the production process. So when you're doing your editing, stick with something that's lower than what comes out of your camera, like as low as you think you can go. And then when you're doing your post-production color grading and stuff like that, stick with something that's higher than what comes out of your camera so that then you've got more space to work with. If you've got a camera that produces really, really high quality images, like a red camera or maybe like one of the 5D Mark III's, then you don't need to worry about it. You can just revert to your camera footage if you want to. However, if you're using Final Cut Pro 7, you're going to have to convert it. Otherwise, you're going to have to wait for a lot of rendering. So <clears throat> it's also worth bearing in mind, depending on the type of computer you're using, the type of camera that you've got and the software that you're using, will also depend on what codec you select and what bitrate you select within your codec. One thing I'd like to point out is that you could use one of the uncompressed codecs to encode your footage. However, unless you've got a really, really powerful machine and a hell of a lot of space, you're just going to find this more cumbersome to work with. Rendering a one minute piece of footage using this type of codec would take a very long time and take up huge volumes of space. So you need to really have the capacity to be able to work with it. You need a top end machine to do this. Most people don't have the equipment to be able to run this kind of thing. So keep that in mind, you're not going to see the benefits, especially if you're uploading your footage to the internet by using one of these uncompressed codecs. You're better off sticking with one of the ProRes 444 codecs or at least using the data rate as a guide. Your average Joe does not need to use this. You are not going to see any benefits using this. If anything, you're just going to slow yourself down and make the whole process much more strenuous and much more time consuming for both you and your machine and anyone else working with you. So take that as a good tip. Stick with the guides that I'm giving you. Don't go uncompressed. It's not necessary. Whew, so that was a hell of a lot of information there. Um, so here's a good example of how to show you. So if I come down here, I can restrict my bit rate to something really low, like 1000 kilobits a second. 1000 is actually a little bit low. Maybe sticking with something like 5000 is adequate for the sort of work that you'll be doing.
and that will be really really low quality um, it'll be good for editing I maintain my h264 compression type or codec um, and everything's hunky-dory so if you're working in something like Adobe Premiere that's fine for you but again I'm working in Final Cut Pro 7 so and I'm working on a Mac so I can use the ProRes stuff so I'm going to drag this on here and now I'm just going to run through frame rate with you so frame rate is the speed at which your footage was recorded now this was recorded at 25 frames per second and if you were to leave it at automatic it would just re-encode your footage at whatever the source frame rate is. If you've filmed your footage at something like 50 frames or 60 if you're using NTSC then you could conform it down to 30 or to 25 if you wanted to and then run all of your footage at the same rate and then if you decided you wanted to use it for slow motion later for example you could find that 50 or 60 frames per second clip and then convert it into the format that you wanted to leaving the frames per second the same as the source and then doing your slow-mo and reconforming it later to actually fit so just to reiterate what will happen is if this is a 50 frames per second clip and I select 25 it won't double the length of the clip it will just remove the additional frames so if I wanted to slow-mo it I need to leave it at its natural its native rate and either know what that is by and select 50 or select 60 or leave it automatic and let it do it do its thing so it might be 120 if you come off a GoPro or something so that's important to remember if you want to slow-mo stuff um, whether you want to conform your frame rate to a specific frames per second or whether you want to leave it at its native recorded speed and then have the opportunity to play with it again later and slow-mo it or time remap it or whatever format you want to whatever way you want to address it in post-production and then the last thing that I'm going to mention is frame size now this is a really really important one to know um, you should never ever go up in frame size but you can always come down so if you filmed at 1080 you can go down to 720 if you want to and it will just reconform and condense your image without stretching it or distorting it into that format but if you go up to, from 720 to 1080 it will stretch your image, it will try and drag pixels over areas that they shouldn't fit in. You don't have the data within your file to be able to make that image larger. So all you're going to do is distort it and make it look ugly and pixelated. So remember, you can always go down, but you can never go up. If you were to leave it on automatic, for example, and leave it to scale to the source, if you filmed at 1080 and you wanted to put it into a 720 clip, you could do that. and it would give you a lot more flexibility. So if I show you in Photoshop, this is a 1080 screen grab of my background on my desktop. And if I change the canvas size to 12A720, so now this is a 720p canvas. Yeah, a little bit of clipping and then you can see now that this is where my original 1080 clip is and this is what it will display on 720 so if I've got a huge image that I've either done a time-lapse with or even if I've got a camera that films in like 4k for example or 2k I have the opportunity to select the composition that I want my image to be at and you can do this in your editing software you can have your canvas or your uh, in Final Cut I think it's called your sequence the size of your sequence to be 1080 or 720 and then you could effectively bring in your footage that's either filmed at a much higher rate or if it's a time lapse you know it's going to be a huge image and then you can pick where you want your crop to be and essentially giving yourself the composition that you desire rather than letting the programs just scale the whole thing down for you and you're not having any choice about how it looks or where the crop goes or even if there is a crop so you can see there's a lot of advantages just to leaving a resolution at a larger size and then bringing it into a smaller canvas later. You have much more flexibility. So that's something to bear in mind. And that's it guys. Once you've done that, um, you know all of the basic information about encoding your footage. Find the location you want to store it in. The only other advice I can give you is make sure that you store it in a separate location to where all of your original 
source material is. So for example, in compressor, if I leave the location the same as the source, I get this uh, tag that appears at the end of the file name that's a replica of whatever settings I've applied. So in this instance, I've applied uh, Apple ProRes 222 copy and my footage will then be renamed whatever the original footage name was with Apple ProRes 422 copy at the end. If I change the location to, for example, I have a temporary one set up, it will maintain the original file name. Now, what's good about this is when it comes time to replace your footage and swap to that higher level footage from the much lower quality stuff or even replace it with your native camera footage, if you maintain the same file name system, and the same file structure when you've organized it, you'll actually only have to find one clip and then your video editing software will use the same hierarchies throughout all of the folders and it will find every clip for you really, really quickly. If you don't and you use a different organizing system, so you file things in a slightly different way, slightly different folder names, or you have slightly different file names, you're going to have to find each individual clip that's got a different name or that's stored in a different location and rematch it up to the ones in your editing software. So that's a really, really kind of good tip to remember. Make sure that you keep your file systems the same and your file names the same whenever you re-encode, transcode, or make new footage. Okay, and that's everything you need to know. If you've got any questions, drop them in the comments, and thanks for listening. Don't forget to check out the rest of our tutorials. Oh, <laughs> oh,